I'd like us to pray and then uh, we look uh, at this session. Heavenly Father, it's so wonderful again to share your word. And Lord, to know the underlying issues and the things that uh, we profess, believe, and speak. I pray that uh, the spirit of the Son may anoint my mind, you may touch my lips, and the holy angels that excel in strength may be in our midst as we share your word that uh, not even one statement may come from my mouth which will not glorify you and misrepresent heaven in the issues that has to do with eternal life. And so, Lord, speak to me and speak to us through me as a vessel. And let all the glory of man be laid in dust that Christ alone may be glorified, uplifted up and put on the throne of the heart that their children may worship you in truth and in spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I can just start by saying that uh, the issue of justification by faith is uh, a message that uh, brings gladness, joy, and happiness to our hearts, which has been bombarded with sin, which has been under the struggle and weight of sin. We read in Romans chapter 8, even the creature groans to see the manifestation of men, the revelation of the character of Christ in those who profess him. And where does even the creature groan under the weight of this issue of sin? It is that uh, the creature has been put under vanity. There is so much suffering in the world because of sin. And even the brute animals the creatures of intellect have been uh, have put uh, these creatures under the burden of sin. The creatures of intellect have put the creatures of instinct under the burden of sin. And so it uh, behooves those who have reason to rise up to the occasion and uh, make the choices that are apt to bring an end to this issue of sin and usher in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are told that uh, we are not just to wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ, but we are to hasten it. And how do we hasten the coming of the Lord? It is by living that life that is worthy our calling, making an uh, our calling our uh, election sure, as uh, Peter says in the Lord of Peter. And so, after 1888, the messages before that and subsequent messages are so much important to our people who are waiting for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have to make up their minds. They have to make decisions that will show that they understand that Christ is really coming. And so let us see what our brethren thought. What is the basis for existence of Seventh day Adventism? The prophet says that several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith Is the third angel's message. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. Review and Harold, April 1890. 
for those who are just coming in, we have just started Minneapolis 1888, the two Adams. We want to see the nature of these two Adams because a redefinition of sin and and how we look at sin will affect how we preach the message of righteousness by faith. And so what is the basis for existence of Seventh-day Adventists? It is to preach the third angel's message in verity, which is justification by faith. So the above statement shows that 1888 message is not or cannot be a re-emphasis of the 16th century doctrines as important as they are. And as Brother Eric put it in the midday session that uh, our reformers had a message, but it was not a complete message. It was missing an element. Although Martin Luther preached on justification by faith, but he missed a point. Justification by faith is laying the glory of man in dust and uh, being able to enable him to do that which he cannot do and give him a capability of uh, obeying the commandments of God. This is the basis of Seventh-day Adventist existence. A unique to Adventism, justification by faith was the heart of 1888 method. If the message as proclaimed by theologians and evangel uh, evangelists of Sunday keeping churches is the same as preached by us, then the question is begging. We should look at ourselves. If really our message has to be like the Sunday keepers, why are we Seventh-day Adventists then? The question, what reason do Seventh-day Adventists have for existence? If, I, if I'm so fast, please let me get a message to slow down. Our message is a unique message, brothers and sisters. It is not just a, a message like any other message. So let us try and run ahead of time. John Calvin, a thought leader of the 16th century reformation said this, and uh, you understand that in 1888 material, I have been going through history, and then I bring you to the real nitty gritties of the matter. So long as we are without Christ and separated from him, nothing which he suffered and did for the salvation of human race is of the least benefit to us. This is in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 3, Chapter 1, Paragraph 1. This is what John Calvin says. To the study striking contrast, Psalm 5, 18, there are, therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And uh, you will find if you have ever heard about uh, in Adam or in Christ motif, these are some of the issues we are going to deal with because they alter what we believe on sin, justification, righteousness, and all this, and sanctification. And so we hear that uh, one man fell into sin and all men were condemned. And one man through righteousness to all there is the gift. But how far does that, that statement go in Adam motif and in Christ motif? We shall be looking at this pretext study and striking the contrast. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, we get, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. What he says, how about that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. We shall see what we inherit from Adam and what we inherit from Christ, in Adam motif and in Christ motif. 47, the first man is of the earth, that is earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. In 48 of 1 Corinthians 15, we find, as is the earthy, such are they also that earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. 49, as, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You, you start contrasting the points between um, the man of the earth and the man of heaven. You start getting those differences and the contrasts what actually we inherit in Adam and what we inherit in Jesus Christ. 
This is the contrast that these verses are giving unto us. And more specifically, for sins by man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, 21, we are not talking just about uh, the consequence of uh, Adam's sin, but uh, the punishment, the wage of sin. First Corinthians 15, 22, for us in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You start getting these motifs in Adam and in Christ. And people go as far as having this doctrine of original sin, which I'm going to come into in a very short while. Because Adam sinned, all die, and because Christ resurrected, so all shall resurrect or all shall be made alive. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 22 again. For us in Adam, in Adam motif, all die. We shall see why we die and which death we are talking about. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Which, which, which uh, 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 life are we talking about here? Is it in concept or in inness? Acts 17, 26, and hath made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. From one person, God made all nations who live on the earth, and he decided when and where every nation would be. Adam means representative of man. So as Adam came forth from the hand of God, he was to be representative of all men. And so he had to bear the image of God and the glory of God. And he had to teach his descendants about this God he worshipped. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. This is a, a crucial statement in our presentation. This is something to think about. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. So the consequence of one man sinning brought death. And so death passed all men for that all have sinned. So do we die because Adam sinned or we die because we sin. That is something that we should think of. Death is by sin. Look at that statement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death comes by a result of sin. Not because one man has died, has sinned, I mean. And so if you will read such a statements, you have to read them very carefully because is it in concept or in inness? Are we dying because Adam sinned? And this is about uh, eternal death. And we have a death which is a consequence of sin. So if we will read this statement correctly, it is what we call the first death which is a Live is a consequence of man, one man sinning. But the eternal death, which is the wages of sin, death is by sin. For that soul which sinneth shall die, according to Ezekiel. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So all that will sin, then death shall come upon them. Second death. But the consequence of one man's sinning brings us to the first death or that which we call a sleep in Christ. Continued on, this was a legal condemnation on all men. When Adam sinned, 
actually he brought a legal condemnation of all men. We became mortal. And it is not by genes or DNA sin is transferred, brothers and sisters. We do not inherit sin. What we inherit is consequences of sin. Just as we do not inherit death. If we can go into the issue that sin or, or death has come upon all men because Adam sinned, then when you reach at Enoch who did not die, what will you say if you say that sin or death is inherited? Because if you say sin is inherited, then death is inherited. And then when you reach to Enoch, you, you can't explain the thing because Enoch did not die. He walked with God and he was no more. So when we are talking about the legal condemnation of all men and what Adam passed in Adam motif, the first Adam, we have to understand that it is the first death, the consequence, but the eternal death, everyone have a choice. Everyone has an opportunity of second probation to choose if we will live or if we will die. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment, of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. We passed under legal condemnation when Adam sinned. All his posterity now were under a legal sentence of death. That is the consequences of sin. But the eternal death, everyone has a choice. Because we do not inherit sin, we can inherit eternal death. In Adam, Christ motif. And uh, look at this by uh, E.J. Wagoner. Glad tidings, the messenger of uh, righteousness by faith. Sin is a personal matter. Talking about in Adam Christ motif. Because there is this issue that uh, we inherit sin. We are born sinners because Adam sinned. And then if this is the issue that uh, because Adam sinned, we inherit sin. Then what we're inheriting is uh, eternal death. But I have said that when Adam sinned, we have the consequences of sin. And then we die that first death. But eternal death, we have a choice. Just as Christ died for us in a legal status and set the whole world on a second probation. That is how Adam sinned and plunged the whole world into a mortal life or a consequences of sin, which is death. And so sin is a personal matter. A man is guilty only of his own sins and not of those which another has committed. Now I cannot sin where I am not. You see that? We cannot say that we inherit sin from Adam. And although it can be argued that we were in the loins of Adam, how can it be said that we sin when Adam sinned? Such a things cannot be. We're going to say, now I, I, I cannot sin where I am not, but only where I am. Sin is in the heart of a man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulterers, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. It is not nature, but something that somebody decides. It's a personal matter. That is Mark 7, 21, 23. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. Sin is in every fiber of our being by nature. We are born in sin and our life is sin so that sin cannot be taken from us without taking a life. What I need is freedom from any, my, person, my own personal sin. That sin which not only has been committed by me personally, but which dwells in the heart. The sin which constitutes the whole of my life. 
And remember here, the pioneer is talking about sin is a personal matter. Sin is a choice. We decide what to do, not to inherit sin. The original sin concept and uh, how it plays with the immaculate conception. And uh, if we say sin is nature, the problem, the underlying problem with saying sin is nature, we want to see, instead of sin being a choice, we want to see what are the underlying problem that sin is nature rather than an action, a choice. Here, in the General Conference Bulletin, 1901, we read, was Christ that holy thing which was born of the Virgin Mary, born in a sinful flesh? Did you ever hear of the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? And let me pause here a moment and say something. If uh, sin is nature, and the first Adam gave us that nature, then the second Adam has to cancel that. And what do I mean by this? If Adam, in Adam, we got the nature of sin, and sin is not a choice, then when Christ comes and obeys, and he goes to heaven, then there's no one who needs to be lost, even if they do something wrong, because the second Adam, we are told by scripture, cancels what the first Adam did. Because we are told that in Adam, all die, because Adam sinned, and in Christ all live because Christ is obedient or has done or has given the obedience that is required by the law. So if we say that sin is nature, in Adam motif we passed from life to death, and sin is nature and not a choice. Then the second Adam, because he has canceled what the first Adam did, then we do not have a choice of our own. By default, because Christ has died on the cross, we have to be entitled to heaven, whichever choices that we make in life. And this is the underlying problem with the issue that sin is nature and sin is not a choice. And this is what we call original sin concept. And I want you to see the underlying points in the original sin concept. And uh, I'll request Brother Zadok to be approving the people who comes in. Please, as I present, thank you. And so the underlying issues in original sin concept and sin is nature is this. Was Christ the holy thing which was born of the Virgin Mary? Born in a sinful flesh. Did you ever hear of the Roman Catholic of the Immaculate Conception? If sin is nature, then it actually alters the nature of Jesus Christ when he comes on this earth. And you know what it is. Some of you possibly have supposed in hearing of it that it meant that Jesus Christ was born sinless. Some people think that the original sin concept is that Christ was born sinless, but that is not the concept. That is not the Catholic dogma at all. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was born sinless. Why? Ostensibly to magnify Jesus, really the work of the devil, to put a white gulf between Jesus, the Savior of men, and the man whom he came to save, so that one could not pass over to the other. That is all. And so if we reduce sin to nature, it makes Christ have another nature in his coming on this earth, in his incarnation. And what does uh, Etijonis continue to say? He says, we need to settle every one of us whether we are out of the church of Rome or not. There are great many that have got the marks yet, but I am persuaded of this, that every soul who is here tonight desires to know the way of truth and righteousness. Congregation, amen. And that there is no one here who is unconsciously clinging to the dogmas of the papacy. Who does not desire to be freed from them? Do you not see that the idea that the flesh of Jesus was not like ours because we know ours is sinful, 
necessarily involves the idea of the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary. And so if we go to sin its nature, Christ has to be exempted from our nature. He has to come in a different nature to save us. And what will that be? Because if Christ is not of our nature, how can we come to the point to believe that we can overcome sin? Because if he is not of our nature and he overcame sin, then what? There is no way we can be told that in this nature we can overcome sin. And so it brings about the original sin concept of immaculate conception that Christ was not of our nature. If we take sin by nature and not sin by action. Mind you, in him was no sin, but the mystery of God manifest in the flesh, the mother of the ages, the wand of the angels, that thing which even now they desire to understand, and which they can form no just idea of, only as they are taught in it is it, taught it by the church. Is the perfect manifestation of the life of God in its postless purity in the midst of sinful flesh? Congregation, amen. Oh, that is a marvel, is it not? But Jonas doesn't end there. He continues. I want you to look at the screen and I'll read slowly through it. I'll read slowly through it. I hope you can see my screen. Suppose we start with the idea for a moment that Jesus was so separate from us. That is so different from us that he did not have in his flesh anything to contend with. It was sinless flesh. Then, of course, you see how the Roman Catholic dogma of the immaculate conception necessarily follows. But why stop there? Mary being born sinless, then, of course, her mother also had sinless flesh. But you cannot stop there. You must go back to her mother and in turn her mother and her mother and her parent, and so back until you come to Adam, and the result, what will you have? There never was a fall. Adam never sinned, and thus you see, by that tracing of it, we find the essential identity of Roman Catholicism and spiritualism, and all other false doctrine. Evolutions also, which claim that there are never has been any fall, but only an ascent that there is evil. So there is no fall, but there is evil. The spiritualistic idea that everything in man is right and man is God himself. You see, it comes to that when you trace it back. If we can go that sin is nature, then if we will have to exempt Mary from this nature, we will exempt the mother of Mary, and so on and so on, and whom do we reach at? At Adam and there is no fall. But if we go that sin is a choice, then the dilemma is solved. We continue. <clears throat> the words of the Bible concerning Christ we have read. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in this pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are prone tempted. We read of the suffering of Christ, Christ also hath made suffering for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. How many of you are there who think that the suffering of Christ was only the few moments that he hung upon the cross when his hands and feet were pierced or while being mocked by the Roman soldiers? No, not then alone. He suffered being tempted. Jesus Christ suffered no less than after the baptism. For 40 days and 40 nights he was in the wilderness tempted of the devil than when later in the garden he suffered and was tempted. And so we find that sin is not nature, but sin is a choice. He, was suff he suffered being tempted. Where did he suffer? We read in First Peter 4, 1. For so much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same. What flesh? Arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the last of men. He was tempted in the flesh. The underlying doctrine in Immaculate Conception. 
This is Etijones in Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald. It is thoroughly understood that in his birth, Christ did partake of the nature of Mary. But the carnal mind is not willing that God in his perfection of holiness could endure to come to men where they are in their sinfulness. Therefore, endeavor has been made to escape the consequences of this glorious truth, which is the emptying of self by inventing a theory that the nature of the Virgin Mary was different from the nature of the rest of mankind. So if you take sin by nature, you know what you do? Another thing, you have given Mary an advantage over any other human being that ever lived. And you have not only given Mary an advantage, but you have given the mother of Mary an advantage, the mother of her mother, and as Etijone said, her parents. They have an advantage because they didn't have our nature. Because we are born with a different nature unlike them. And so, this judge of all the earth who judges without partiality, how will he judge me and judge Mary? With the same law and with the same failings that I have when we have different natures? Jesus be of benefit to me. Against the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and the pioneers and uh, the messengers of 1888. This invention sets up that some special means Mary was made different from the rest of human beings, especially in order that Christ might be becomingly born of her. This invention has incarnated in what is known as the Roman Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Many Protestants, if not the vast majority of them, as well as other non-Catholics, think that the Immaculate Conception refers to the conception of Jesus by Virgin Mary, but this is an altogether mistake. It refers not all to the conception of Christ by Mary, but to the conception of Mary herself by her mother. This is the underlying issues in the definition of sin being nature it will go along a list of people who are exempted from this. The official and infallible doctrine of the Immaculate Conception as solemnly defined as an article of faith by Pope Pius. This is uh, the ninth, speaking ex cathedra on 8th December 1854 is as follows. There are see, where this doctrine comes from. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is the Pope speaking ex cathedra, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary, in the first instant of her conception, by a special grace and privilege of Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, was preserved free from all stain of original sin. That is in Adam motif. The problem you are having right now is in Adam motif. That nature has been passed to us which is sinful and not just the consequences. And so we are sinners by birth. We are sinners by nature. We inherit sin and not the consequences of sin. And so if we die before we even reach any accountability age, or we even speak or do anything, we are lost. We are born sinners. And so it goes to say that her nature was preserved from all the stains of sin. And so it is steadfastly believed by all faithful. That is the Roman Catholics. And you find that this is what actually is preached. Etijones goes on to say, Wherefore, if any shall presume which may God avert to think in their heart otherwise than has been defined by us, that is the Roman Catholic, let them know and moreover understand that they are condemned by their own judgment, that they have made shipwreck as regards the faith and have fallen away from the unity of the church. So if you believe sin is not nature, you have fallen from the unity of the church, according to the uh, Catholic doctrine of sin. This conception is defined by Catholic writers thus. The ancient writer 
And now see this, I want you to follow along with me in this gymnastics about uh, sin is nature. It is a nice story reading, but it's nonetheless such a sad story. The ancient writer D. Nativitate Christi found in St. Cyprian's works says, because Mary being very different from the rest of mankind, human nature, but not sin, communicated itself to her. Now, I'd like us to go slowly and see this, what uh, the uh, Christ says. Because Mary being very different from the rest of mankind, human nature, but not sin, communicated itself to her. So her nature, the nature of Jesus, of uh, Mary, was communicated to her. Now, her, read along with me. Theodore, patriarch of Jerusalem, said in the second council of Nice that Mary is truly the mother of God and virgin before and after childbirth. And she She was created in a condition more sublime and glorious than that of all natures, whether intellectual or corporal. Now, remember we are talking about in Adam motif and in Christ motif, is sin choice and is righteousness choice, or as Adam passed upon us condemnation and we are born sinners, then Christ, in Christ, it will have to change everything. If in Adam motif means that we are born sinners, then in Christ motif, when he obeyed, no one has to be judged guilty of anything. We have to go to heaven. There sh should be no even judgment going on. Because Adam made us born sinners. Christ has made us righteous and we do not have a choice of our own. The two cancels each other if you believe sin is nature. And so Mary is truly the mother of God and virgin before and after childbirth, and she was created in a condition more sublime and glorious than that of all natures, whether intellectual or corporal. This, this doctrine as even, you know, sometimes we subscribe to doctrines which we do not know the underlying issues behind them. Just like uh, sometimes we embrace the one true God message and uh, we start hating Trinity or other people start pro, uh, promoting Trinity, but you don't understand the underlying issues in the Trinity or believing in one true God. There is more than just what appears on the surface when people talk about these true doctrines. There is a deeper meaning in what is being said. It is not just about original sin, we are born sinners, we inherit sin and all that stuff. No. It is not just about saying that there is no heaven in the sanctuary. It is not just about saying that uh, the Sabbath is Saturday, the seventh day, or uh, Sunday is the first day. Behind every doctrine, there are deeper underlying issues. And that is why we are being told we should not just accept a doctrine because some popular person is preaching about it. Some prominent person is teaching about it. We should believe after underlying what salvational issues is in that doctrine and how it affects atonement. And this plainly puts the nature of Mary entirely beyond any real likeness or relationship to mankind or human nature as it is. Having this clearly is in mind, let us follow the invention in its next step. Thus it is as given in the words of Cardinal Gibbons. Pause. Now, in fact, this original sin and sin is nature, actually it destroys the Genesis creation. I'll tell you why. When Christ created humanity, and when Christ had made everything that is on the earth, he said that let every kind produce of its own kind. Now, if the nature of Mary was communicated to her and it was different from our nature, then Mary should never be married to Joseph because Joseph himself is of different nature from Mary. And God forbids two kinds of seeds coming together to mate or to reproduce. So as it is in the, uh, the natural things like let us say the trees, the fishes, the animals, and all these other created uh, or, uh, creatures, so it comes to humanity. If the nature of Mary 
was so different from the nature of humankind, then Mary shouldn't be even married to Joseph in the first place. So this whole issue of sin is nature and original uh, sin concept, it actually destroys the Genesis story of creation. And that is why the Roman Catholics do not believe in a Genesis story of creation. They believe in evolution. Brothers and sisters, do you see the underlying issues in the concept that sin is nature? I'll continue. It says, we affirm that the second person of the blessed Trinity, this is the Catholic saying, the word of God, who is who in his divine nature is from all eternity begotten of the Father, consub, consubstantial with him was in the fullness of time again begotten by being born of the virgin, thus taking to himself from her maternal womb a human nature of the same substance with the husband. So it is said that Christ took a nature of Mary. But let us continue with this issue. As far as the sublime ministry of the incarnation can be reflected in the natural order, the Blessed Virgin, under the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost, by communicating to the second person of the adorable Trinity, as mothers do, a true human nature of the same substance with her own, is thereby really and truly his mother, faith of her father's page 198. I don't know if you are understanding what is on the screen. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And in that overshadowing, there was the second person of the adorable Trinity. And as mothers do, a true human nature of the same substance with her own is thereby really and truly his mother. Now, you have to understand in this issue, if that is the case, and we know that the nature of Christ is dual that is humanity and divinity if this is what happened to mary and then the nature of jesus christ is the nature of mary and mary becomes the mother of the of god then truly mary has divine nature because that is only what he can pass to jesus and that is why mary is exempted from original sin and sin being nature this is the whole underlying issues to do with sin is nature. Now put two things together. First, we have the nature of Mary defined as being not only different from the rest of mankind, but more sublime and glorious than all natures, thus putting her infinitely beyond any real likeness or relationship to mankind as we really are. Now that is a nature that is not human even because it's different from the human nature. Next, we have Jesus described as taking from her a human nature of the same substance as hers. From this theory, it is there follows as certainly as two and two make four that in his human nature, the Lord Jesus is different from mankind. Indeed, his nature is not human nature at all, but divine. So Mary must be divine because what she has begotten is divine. For their nature is not the nature of humanity, but another nature altogether so different. Brothers and sisters, can you accept this doctrine and pull out all this garbage that comes with it? It is impossible, very impossible, to say that sin is nature and avoid all that we are reading. That is the Roman Catholic doctrine concerning the human nature of Christ. But Catholic faith is not the faith of Christ. It is the faith of Antichrist. Etijones finishes. That is why we hear that uh, there are so, so many man antichrists that have come into the world, yet we still await for antichrist. Yes, I know there's that man of sin. The Catholic doctrine of the human nature of Christ is simply that the nature is not human nature at all, but divine. It is that in his human nature, Christ was so far separated from mankind as to be utterly unlike, a nature in which he could have no sort of fellow feeling with mankind. Now you understand we are talking about the nature of sin. Is sin nature or is sin choice? And if sin is nature, then we have Mary not being a human being but a divine being. And we have Christ not being of a nature but a different nature. Yet it really comes to loggerheads with the Bible and what it reveals that Christ 
inherited this. There is no way Christ can be an, our example if he, has, he doesn't have our nature. But such is not the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is that as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. I'll be coming to this statement in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible, when we shall be looking so closely at the nature of Jesus Christ and what we inherit at birth in the subsequent presentations. So we are just laying ground the nature of man. The nature of man and the nature of Jesus Christ, we are just building a foundation. And this is what E.J. Wagoner did before he presented the message of righteousness by faith. He went into the nature of Jesus Christ before he went into the doctrine of righteousness by faith. We miss a lot of things when we don't study the way our pioneers studied their messages. The joy of the truth, as uh, I come to segment two of this presentation. Just as the first Adam was the representative head and embraced all humanity, so too Jesus must embrace all humanity as the new representative head. So if we say that sin is nature, then in Adam all are lost, nothing more, nothing less. And so in Jesus Christ, because he obeyed, no one is lost, nothing more, nothing less if we go by the doctrine that uh, sin is nature and not choice. Through the first Adam's death, all died, so too through the death of second Adam, all died. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus die that if anyone died for all, then we are all dead. We are ruled by the love of Christ now that we recognize that one man died for everyone, which means that they all share in his death. So, Ezekiel, If sin is nature, they have to pass the same nature to their posterity. Don't you think so? Look, look at Ezekiel 14, 20 on your screen. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, said the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own soul by their righteousness. Just like sin cannot be passed to anyone, so righteousness cannot be passed to anyone. If sin is nature, then righteousness is nature. And if I am a righteous person today, then why should even I fear about giving birth or uh, having a family? I'm righteous. My posterity have to be righteous because sin is nature and righteousness is nature. There's no underlying choices. But because sin is not to face the consequences of our choices. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Come under the same circumstance as those he came to redeem. Hebrews 2.14 says, For so much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so our condemnation was eternal death. That is the legal status. Christ steps in and cancels the legal condemnation by giving us a second probation. When Christ died for all, he tested death for everyone. That is the carriers, putting us on second probation, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Hebrews 2, 9. It had to be the second death that he tested, because what we call death, the Bible calls sleep, which everyone experienced except those who will be translated, John 11, 11 13, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and 17. So there was the legal condemnation that actually Adam passed us into when he sinned. But that legal condemnation is changed by the death of Jesus Christ. But I'll simplify the matter. But now, but it's now made manifest for the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and then hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For everyone, believers and unbelievers, he has brought life, but to the believer, he has brought immortality. 
So we are on second probation. Adam was put in the garden of Eden, he sinned and passed the legal condemnation. Now Christ comes in and abolishes death, not the consequences of, of sin, but the wages of sin. And he brings life and immortality. Whoever chooses then Jesus Christ and lives that life, accepting Christ to live in him, then he is uh, accepted. He passes from death to life. Let us look at uh, some scenario here. A second prosecution for the same offense after acquittal. The Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution provides no person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. This provision known as the double jeopardy clause prohibits state and federal governments from prosecuting individuals for the same crime one more than one occasion or imposing more than one punishment for a single offense. He says, through his death, Christ has given all men a verdict of acquittal. That which we were condemned for, now we are acquitted. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He cannot condemn us twice or lay that which was taken on him on us again. It is unbelief or refusal which condemns the sin. It is not nature that condemns us, brothers and sisters. It is unbelief or refusal to accept the inviting mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what puts us in problem. And so the doctrine of Sin is nature. Cannot be accepted at all. When uh, you look at the book of Romans 5.10, it says, if the death of his son restored our relationship with God while we were still the, his enemies, we are even more certain that because of his restored relationship, the life of his son will save us. The good news is that uh, when we repent, when we believe, when we come to Christ, we partake of his righteousness. And in Christ, we live. How do we live in Christ? By partaking of the divine nature, by escaping the corruptions that are in this world. Sin passed to man because one man, death passed to man because one man sinned. But through the second Adam, everything is changed. We have a choice then. Jesus is our second Adam. He was born for us and like unto us to live this life righteously, to give an example to man that uh, divinity combined with humanity does not commit sin. So, let us look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, and Romans 5, 18 again. Let us look at this matter once again. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by grace of God, should taste death for every man. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The gift has to be received. By the death of Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that by nature we are righteous. We still struggle with sin in us. And every day we have to make a choice if we will live for him. or we will live to gratify the, the last of the flesh. And so, Sister White says this, 1SM 389.2. Let us look at some of the spirit of prophecy statements. They'll shed more light on this. Calling and justification are not one and the same thing. Calling is the drawing of the sinner to Christ, and it is a work wrought by the Holy Spirit upon the heart, convicting of sin and inviting to repentance. 
So if sin is nature, why should we be invited to repentance? Because Christ has canceled everything and we don't have to do, we don't have a choice of our own. By the way, the story that uh, sin is nature, it violates what we call freedom of conscience and freedom of choice. Because now you don't have to choose for your life because you inherit it. That is the thing. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them, unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God imputed our trespass to Christ. Now, if sin is nature, then what we need only is imputed righteousness where actually everything is conferred to Christ. But when it comes to imparted righteousness, we do not need it because sin is nature. And because it has been laid to Christ, imputed on Christ, then why should we be imparted righteousness? What is imparted righteousness? The ability to be able to do good, the power, the grace, the enabling power to do good. So if sin is nature, because Christ has canceled the nature of us inheriting sin, now he gives us his nature, which is righteousness, imputed righteousness. Where does imparted righteousness work? No, it's not there. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm a child of God by imputed righteousness. There is no need of imparted righteousness. I can be angry. I can abuse you. I can do all I can because I'm not a child of Adam. Christ canceled that. And so I do not need imparted righteousness. This is, these are the underlying issues in sin is nature. And so, brethren, let us be careful what we embrace. Let us be very careful what we embrace and how we loud out people of what they are preaching. Yes, in Adam, we were condemned because there is nothing good we inherit in Adam but consequences. But it doesn't mean that we inherit from him sin. Just like we do not inherit righteousness from Jesus Christ. And the reason why we will suffer eternal death, it is because of our choices. It is not because of uh, the legal status that Adam put us in. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So in Adam motif means to choose to do sin. In Christ motif means to choose to do righteousness. It is not nature we are talking about. When we talk about in Adam motif and all men will die, yes, they will die and this is eternal death, if they choose to continue in transgression as Adam transgressed, all men die because of sin. Which death? Eternal death. And all men shall live in Christ, which kind of life? Eternal life because they have chosen to partake of the righteousness by walking at Christ's work. Christ has bought us with an infinite price. He has restored the whole race of men in favor with God. And we have to say amen to that. He gives us the power. And I'll close with these three quotes, which are so powerful, I'd like to share with you in closing. I'm past time by one minute, but uh, I hope you bear with me. I'll close with these three quotes, which are marvelous to me. From Help for the Daily Living, from page 29, in closing, we need not to keep our own record of trials and difficulties, griefs and sorrows. Know what you have in Christ. All these things are written in the books and heaven will take care of them. 
while we are counting up the disagreeable things, many things that are pleasant to reflect upon are passing from memory, such as the merciful kindness of God surrounding us every moment and the love over which angels marvel that God gave his son to die for us. If as workers for Christ you feel that you have had a greater cares and trials than have fallen to the lot of others, remember that for you there is peace unknown to those who shun these burdens. There is comfort and joy in the service of Christ. Let the world see that life with him is no failure. In, in Christ motive. In Adam motive, consequences of sin are passed unto us. We have the last of flesh. And they war against the members of our body and we choose to do wrong. In Christ motive, he, he passes us from the legal condemnation. And then justification is not just a legal declaration, but he gives us power to overcome sin. Second last quote. If you do not feel lightened, lighthearted and joyous, do not talk of your feelings. If you do not feel lighthearted and joyous, do not talk of your feelings. Cast no shadow upon the lives of others. A cold, sin, sunless religion never draws souls to Christ. It drives them away from him into the nets that Satan has spread for the feet of their strength. Instead of thinking of your discouragement, think of the power you can claim in Christ's name. So righteousness is the power that can be claimed from Christ and then wrote in our lives. Let your imagination take hold upon things unseen. Let your thoughts be directed to the evidence of great love of God for you. Faith can endure trial. Resist temptation. Bear up under disappointment. Jesus lives as our advocate. All is ours that his mediation secures. When notwithstanding the sacrifice constant, we rest confident in his life and shut ourselves in with him. The sense of his presence will inspire a deep tranquility. Of himself, Christ said, I do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please me, please him. Last, the Father's presence is circled Christ, and nothing befell him that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ, in Christ's motive. Whatever comes to him comes from the Savior, who surrounds him with his presence. Nothing can touch him except by the Lord's permission. All our suffering and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadness and grief, all our persecutions and privations. In short, all things work together for our good. All experiences and circumstances are God's work, and whereby good is brought to us. May the Lord continue shedding his light upon our souls as we wait for his second coming. There is no one who wants to cling to the doctrines of the purpose and become an antichrist. Let us know the underlying issues when we talk about in Adam motif and in Christ motif. And we shall continue looking at this issue of the nature of Christ and the nature of man. As we go through this just message of justification by faith at 1888 standpoint. Otherwise, the Lord bless you and shall we bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank Thank you for your good. Thank you for the love and thank you for the mercies. I just pray that, Lord, we may not make gods from false theories. You can say that we can have gods out of false theories. But, Father, I want you to save us from this. For whatever we believe really affects our character and how we look at you and how we live in the present life. And so, Lord, I pray you may teach us. For you say that how that when the Spirit comes, even the Spirit of truth, he shall guide us in all truth. We want to hear and abide to the messages that you are giving us in these end times. And so we surrender before thee, take our hearts and seal it for the courts above in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.